haven't met me or if you weren't there during Barnes' introduction yesterday, my name is Dave Fisher. Uh, I live in uh, Pennsylvania in the United States, and I don't get out much, and so uh, this is one of the reasons why, if, since I'm here, this is the first time I've left the country, in fact. First, well, I've been across the line to Canada, but that, that doesn't count that much in the United States. Um, so, um, you know, when you get to the border, they just say, ah, and uh, it used to be that way, but it's a little different now. So, thank you for those of you who are British, I guess. Thank you for welcoming me so much to Britain. Uh, this is, you know, I've waited 48 years to leave the United States, and I showed up in like the most beautiful place I've ever seen, I think. And so all of England looks like this, apparently. <laughs> is my, that's, that's my... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, in fact, as you're going to see through my talk, as I was, as I was putting together these slides, uh, I realized how indebted I am to the English, uh, uh, or overall. I know we use those sort of interchangeably. I know there's a difference between English and British and, you know, UK and all that. Uh, but I, have to, I am a, a history teacher. Uh, uh, for 26 years teaching high school history and, and uh, especially world history, so I at least know uh, that little bit. But um, uh, so I, I thank you for uh, you know inviting me to this, especially you know uh, Barn and uh, uh, Robin and JoJo and all the people that organized this. It's you know an honor to be here. Um, I must. I'm going to start with a slide to tell you uh, about, you know, I teach 16, 17 year old students uh, uh, all the time and sometimes, you know, they're not that complimentary toward, you know, that's the, the nature of, of that. But the best compliment, uh, or the one I'm most proud of, I received from one of my students a couple years ago and actually involves uh, Britain because uh, they told me uh, one student is about who I look like, and you know, usually you hear things, you look kind of like, and you're not very happy with who, who they suggest, but this British citizen student said, well, I think you look like that guy, and so here it is, and now nothing makes my wife laugh more than, than this fact, that the student thought I look like, uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go, <laughs> I mean, Really? <laughs> I'm James Bond. A lot of you guys thought when I walked through the field the first day, probably. I, yeah, so, uh, really, all it is is a haircut, and I, you know, it could look, you know, I'd get a suit. Uh, so, my, my wife thinks it's pro oh, you got, I'll let you, am I blocking part? Okay. My wife thinks it's more likely this. So, no, okay, so, ah, uh, boo, uh, as an American, I'm not, I'm not about to uh, make fun of British politics for sure right now, so, yeah, okay, no. <laughs> all right, so, anyway, uh, you know, the more I thought about, uh, you know, uh, doing the talk, the more I was kind of looking forward to it, because um, this is American poet Mary Oliver, and one, one of the lines she had in one of her poems I thought was, you know, uh, very nice advice. It was instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And I think that's what a lot of us do, you know, whether you're, we're instructors or whether we're just in love with, you know, carving spoons or whatever it is we do. We're amazed by something and somebody comes along and you can share it with them and it's, you know, what we're doing here. And so I'll share a little bit of what has astonished me over these years. Um, and so I'm going to start with where I've been, then I'm going to tell you a li little bit about uh, what inspires me still about, uh, and as it's related to wood carving, um, and, you know, what's going to happen next, uh, because that's what Robin asked me to talk about. So. Uh, Here's where I've been, all the time, yeah, <laughs> right there. Uh, in fact, I, I was born, Greenville, Pennsylvania, it's hard to tell by the arrow, but it's just 
to the east of the Ohio-Pennsylvania line uh, between Pittsburgh and Erie, Pennsylvania, which would be uh, you know, right up here on Lake Erie. And um, so small rural, rural town uh, used to have a lot of industry like Pittsburgh, uh, as you know, some people call the area the Rust Belt heading up through uh, from Pittsburgh. So of course the town has uh, uh, shrunk over the years from in the 50s, 9,000 people to now about 5,000 people. Um, but it's still, you know, my home. And I was born in a hospital in Greenville that's at one block from where I live now for, uh, and a, a few blocks from where I grew up. And I teach at the high school I went to school at in Gr Greenville High School that is five blocks I walk to school every day. Uh, and so uh, that suits me, and uh, I like it. But this is I, this could become addictive, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting out a little bit. So uh, that's where I've been, uh, Greenville. This is just a quick shot of Greenville. That's uh, downtown. That's the whole thing, downtown. <laughs> uh, of course. That, that looks a little uh, picturesque. If you go a little bit further, you get the Walmart and the Wendy's, you know, and that, that kind of thing out a little bit further. But that's uh, when it's, uh, it's interesting when I've been, you know, even on the train ride in, in England and, and looking around the countryside here, you can see structures that you can tell or these stone walls that go back centuries and, and so on. Where in, in my town, if something's from the mid 19th century, people go, oh, that. That house was built in 1880, you know, and, uh, and oh, you know, that's, uh, that's amazing. Now, that's a big difference. In Philadelphia, things go back to the, you know, 17th century, but uh, we didn't cross the, the Appalachians for a couple hundred years, uh, and then, uh, you know, we, you know, pushed people off of there and, and settled in. Uh, so this is a typical building in downtown that you reminded me of the years, you know, what, what's old, uh, where we're from. Unfortunately, that, that building actually burnt down last year. It's a sad story. <laughs> but I got the picture the year before, <laughs> I, walking downtown, and there was a hawk sitting up there. Yeah. So, uh, so this little piece of cherry bark, as it turns out, uh, was my first piece of green woodworking. Uh, this is two years ago. No. <laughs> so uh, when I was nine or ten years old, I remember it very distinctly. Uh, I didn't realize at the time, you know, uh, that it would be connected to things later on. But I remember my my uncle was splitting some firewood, and it would happen to be fresh cherry, probably in the spring. And I remember as he split, some of the bark was actually popping off and it was laying to the side or it could peel off very easily. And I saw that fresh surface of that, you know, inner bark and there happened to be an old nail laying around and I scratched into the fresh bark this picture. And I took that picture of it just the other day before I, I came. And so I still have that piece of bark, which is strange when you move many times or whatever and there's that thing still hanging around. But uh, that, in essence, you know, I feel is still what I'm doing. I'm seeing some amazing, you know, you split a piece of wood down there, and then you, you know, I can make, I, you know, it's like I'm allowed, I can take this sharp thing and make this, and it's a wonderful thing. So that, I think that's still part of what drives me. So how I first got into carving, so, it, you know, I played around with, you know, pocket knives and things when I was a kid, but I never had anybody sit down and say, well, here's how you carve. I don't have the story of, you know, my grandfather sitting me down one day and I don't have a, a master cabinet maker in the family. I, you know, there was none of that. We weren't, I wasn't really exposed to art museums and things like that or a lot of cultural things as, as a kid. Um, but after, when I uh, got my first teaching job, my dad always had a little basement workshop and my grandfather did too, just tinkering around sort of things. And I was allowed to just kind of play around in there and was doing that a lot. But then when I uh, got my first teaching job, I didn't have a workshop. So in my little, I didn't have dad's workshop to play around in. So I got a, uh, a book on carving. I thought, well, here's something I can do in, in the apartment. Long story short, I would, next thing you know, I was at the coffee table 
quite often with, I would clamp boards down to the coffee table and I got five wood carving chisels and would draw a picture of an apple on there, whatever, and then make a little relief carving and another relief carving and, you know, then on and on. And I started to, you know, follow along with books like, uh, you know, like these and especially, uh, here's one of my, you know, in, when I said I was indebted to the, to the English or the British, uh, Chris Pye uh, has a series of carving books and this is on, you know, traditional wood carving, uh, not green wood, but uh, I learned a lot about uh, sharpening tools and how the nature of removing woodwork and things like that. And so here's some of my, this was that first year, this is 1995, and I started uh, carving away at some of these things. Now these aren't the very first ones, but in that first year, my wife really likes Phantom of the Opera, so I made a little box for her and stuff and, you know, did a little relief of the mask. And then, what a, you know, I made a giant thumb, okay? Uh, it's actually, it actually looks bigger in the picture, it's not, <laughs> but she's not such a fan of that. That stays in the shop, you know, the, 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 the Phantom of the Opera box is allowed inside. Um, and then, as I started getting more into it, I started, you know, concentrating on some of the finer points and, you know, doing relief carvings of, you know, just whatever I wanted to do and uh, oak leaves and things like that. And of course, this is mainly flat boards, relief carving, dry wood, buying boards, you know, that sort of thing. But it did give me a good foundation in the sharpening aspect and some of the design and removing wood and so on. But then this, this was just a magical moment for me. I mean, when I see the picture of these books, and these are books, you know, in, at my house here, even just looking at them kind of brings back those, and I think it does for many of you too, the first time you encountered some of these, these books, and the magic that opened, you know, within, especially when this was before there were a lot of YouTube videos, before there were um, a lot of the other resources, and it was this moments of discovery. So uh, the Roy Underhill book series and, and the show and uh, Drew Langsner's, these are a couple of Drew's book, but, you know, books, the, the Green Woodworking book and Country Woodcraft, which Drew's redoing right now and have a new version out before long, actually. Uh, I know I, I, uh, he's been working hard on it. Uh, and again, back to the uh, English here, Mike Abbott, uh, that I'm sure many of you probably know personally, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting uh, Mike, of course, but I, if I do, I'll be sure to tell him that those books were just setting me on fire, too. I mean, the, uh, you know, you, you get that book and you're going to build a pole lathe. I mean, and so <laughs> I, I did, and, and when those, I, I remember there's a line in his book that always struck me about a lot of this, that um, he says something to the effect of, he, he said, okay, your lathe is set up, and now, now go ahead and push the treadle and, the, you know, and take that first shaving. And he pauses a second in the writing and says, oh, to experience that for the first time once again. You know? and, and that always stuck with me, um, that you know, it's part of that exploration and experience of it. Um, and, of course, John Alexander's, Jenny, Jenny Alexander's book, uh, John, when it was written, about make a chair from a tree. Uh, was, you know, again, a, a discovery in another aspect of the green woodworking and uh, Vili's book, Swedish Carving Techniques, which I'm sure means a lot to just about everybody uh, in the room. Uh, and I'll talk more about uh, some of that in a minute. But um, those books, you know, in short, you know, to keep this as brief as I can, were just, those were my guides and inspiration, and I would, I would read and try, and read and try. And for a number of reasons, of course, there weren't as many options of getting together for classes and things like that, and in terms of, you know, just the you know, family situation at the time, that just wasn't on my radar of possibility. And so I would just read, and then put steel to wood, and I knew what to read more carefully then when things weren't going right, and I would just keep experimenting, and it just went on and on through those uh, books. There were also a number of others referring to some of the uh, traditional crafts and old ways, and it, it, again, a lot of them were 
Uh, it's all British, right? I think, right? Uh, and I, I was looking, gosh, I couldn't find my copy of, of John Brown's book. Now, no, to, I, I know John Brown from what I might have a problem if I said English, right? But it was Welsh, John Brown, was he Welsh? At the beginning of the book, I think he really drives that point <laughs> home, if I recall. Um, so anyway, uh, the books like this, again, and mo again with this, this crowd, most of you are, are familiar. If you're not familiar with those, you know that you take a picture of those because those, those are wonderful. Um, and then this thing, this uh, association of pole lathe turners had come about, you know, w through Mike Abbott's books and so on. So I would get, uh, this is just one little example here, but somewhere I have the stacks of the little, uh, the paper cover little newsletters that would come. So I, you know, had to send a little extra postage and, they, and, and then every so often I'd get this cool envelope in the mail with all the, the queen all over it and stamps and so on. And I was, you know, wonderful and uh, all the way from across the pond and I'd read the, you know, the newsletter and find out about all the interesting things people were uh, discovering. And, and of course, Robin was, you know, writing a lot of information through on, on the, you know, online uh, and in the, uh, through uh, his book, The Wooden Bull, which I know deals more specifically with turning, but it's still in that same vein and was incredibly uh, inspiring and all the other information he was providing in many different ways. Uh, I'm gonna make sure I show Yogi the picture of those jeans. Uh, if he, uh, if <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, by the way, for those of you who might have been expecting a Yogi-like presentation here, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, that's not, not, I, can't, I can't do yoga, that's, that's only yoga. So this video follow-up, you know, a companion to the book, Vili's book, was also very influential. So I had to mention these things because that was my sort of spoon fest at the time. I know there's not much social interaction, but uh, in terms of learning the craft, you know, that, that's what I was doing. Uh, and so I have a relatively small shop. It's about 18, it's a one-car one garage that's right off the house that's always been a shop. It's never had a, a car in it uh, since I've been there. And uh, it's just 18 feet by 20 feet, about 200 square feet. And I, or I, f I figured it's 18 square meters or something like that. So uh, uh, that, and so up around the top of the shop, it's just book after book after book uh, that I've, you know, related to these things. Uh, so. I built that, the pole lathe and had the spring pole going from the, the rafters and everything and was doing also, you know, turning some furniture parts, this little candle stand and so on. Uh, I know some of you are, g are gonna ask, but that, that's not end grain, that's a separate a attachment and then was turning it together. So anyway, on the pole lathe, making chairs and stools, that's my daughter, Emma, at the time, she's uh, 21 now, but uh, making, all those things and working with hickory bark and you know all these things experimenting this is my that's a, a picture after i had built it years later but uh, i think it was 2003 that i made the, my first uh, jenny alexander chair uh, and you know that was fascinating as well and i still make some chairs once in a while and then peter folensby had this blog going and I was diving into this idea that you could actually make uh, flat boards. You could take a, a log and make boards and put them together and make these furniture pieces and cases and so on. So I dove into that 17th century style stuff and was making boxes like this and other things. But I ended up concentrating a lot more on the spoons and, and bowls and uh, the sculptural aspects of it, and a lot of that, you know, was the influence of, of Vili, and, you know, this is a quote from his book. This picture is not from that book. This is from one of Drew Langsner's books. Many of you are, are probably aware of this, but there's an interesting connection between a man named Bill Copperthwaite in Maine, who had met Vili in Sweden, and correct me if I'm messing some of this up, but he arranged to have Vili come to Drew. He introduced Vili to Drew Langsner 
And that connection between those three men uh, has just been the foundation of a lot of what has happened since. And, you know, for me personally as well. And so when you look at that picture, you want to do, <laughs> I mean, that is just such a fantastic thing. What kid didn't want to play with an ax? And then you get to use an ax and realize it's not a toy, and it, but it's still fun. Um, and so this is one of, uh, uh, you know, the, my earlier spoons. And you can see, I think, the influence of Villy's style of carving from the book and so on. That, that's been used in our kitchen for over a decade and so on. And I just took that picture the other day. Um, and in this, this is a bowl I made years ago. And I think you can see the influence of uh, Follensby style, the, the kind of carving he was doing on some of the boxes and things, but adapted to a tapered form. And of course, the canvas for it is very much influenced by Bengt Lidstrom, uh, the, the Swedish bowl carver, because Drew had gone over with yoga and filmed him, and I was able to see that, that whole uh, um, the amazing adaptations of traditional Swedish carving that uh, Bengt was doing. So this is my son, who's here now. He's got more hair now. Uh, yeah, over here, uh, Noah's 20. And so ba once I caught that, that the bowl and spoon, but we were just, I was just carving bowl after bowl after bowl uh, until uh, family members had plenty of bowls and made that pretty clear to me uh, that they, they had enough. Uh, so I started doing some local festivals as a way to, you know, I was, had to keep making these bowls, and so I started selling them to some local festivals, and I would be demonstrating and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the people that were coming up to me wanted to know, where, where do I get information? How do I get tools about it? Where do I get what you have here and go, I want to start doing this? And so I, the easiest way, at first I started writing all these things down for them and so on every time. And then I realized I could just easily start a simple website, which I started in, in 2010, and just as a way to provide them, I said, here's step-by-step -step kind of how I make a bowl, and here's some links for tools, et cetera, et cetera. And then in 2015, I started this blog, uh, because there are just other things I wanted to share, and I thought, well, maybe somebody will check it out. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I still enjoy sharing on, on the, the blog. Uh, but here's, you know, how I, you know, how does that bring me to uh, England? Well, in 2015, I had been talking with Peter Follensby, and he, and he gave me a little heads up that there was going to be this event at Lee Nielsen the Yogi was going to be at. He was going to teach this uh, carving class. So I went up there, uh, met Yogi, and a, a lot of other people were up there, including Drew Langsner and Louise, was able to meet them. Uh, and all these things, you know, it was just amazing moments uh, to me. Uh, and um, Peter Follensby was there, and he says to me before I left, uh, we're going to, we're, we're thinking about, I think is close to exact words, we're thinking about doing some crazy stupid thing called Greenwood Fest, uh, and, and we're going to maybe do it next summer in 2016. And if we do it, would you come and do a bowl carving thing, and so on. So, of course, I said, yes, I would. And while we were there, I was able to meet in 2016 Beth. We're getting, wait, on that. okay. So there's Beth Moen from Sweden. Yogi was there, okay, happily carving, and Jojo, okay. <laughs> Those three photos were borrowed from Peter Follensby, so Jojo is here. <laughs> that's, that's dreadlock Jojo, right, Jojo? Okay, so the shoes are still going though, right? Yeah, all right. Um, and I was teaching uh, classes now, you know, suddenly I'm, you know, teaching bowl carving classes, and uh, so year after year in different groups, and then I would go back to with Plymouth Craft to the organization that, that runs Greenwood Fest and do some other teaching with them. Uh, and then at one of the festivals, I met this man named John Binzen. I hadn't been getting Fine Woodworking Magazine. I had no idea who John Binzen was, which was embarrassing later on a little bit. But 
uh, he introduced himself, and I said, oh, hi, John, you know, and we talked for a while, and then he looked at you know, things I had there and everything, and then a few months later, uh, I get a call from him, and he says he's the, he's an editor at Fine Woodworking and wants to put the bowls on the back cover and so on, and so then uh, when he came to do some of the shooting and stuff for, for that, uh, he asked me if I would write some articles, and then that le led to a video with fine woodworking, so that's how all that went. And then last, uh, Greenwood Fest last year, uh, they gave me this uh, Sloyd Fellowship Award, which was an incredible honor, and along with it uh, came some funds so that I could do things like travel here, and, you know, and here I am, okay? <laughs> and so uh, that's it for that. Now, what inspires me and my carving? Now, the obvious thing is I could go through lists of other wood carvers and say, and I love their stuff and that inspires me, but I wanted to mention a couple things about that, but then talk about some of the things you might not expect that inspire me. We all get inspired, of course, by other, other wood carvers. Uh, this bowl is by Bengt Lidstrom, and incredibly, it's at home in my workshop right now. It's something I never thought uh, would happen, but I ended up uh, uh, talking a few times uh, with Jenny Alexander, and uh, long story short, Jenny sent me this bowl that was in her collection uh, because uh, she had done some things to support the making of that film. And what really inspires me, uh, the bowl itself is just amazing, but when you consider, this is the bottom of the bowl, this is 1999 when Bengt made the bowl. He was 83 years old. Now that inspires me when you think, wow, I can, I can do this a long time. You know, that's incredible. Um, this is a traditional Swedish ale bowl. It's just a little sketch from my sketchbook because I was watching this video. There's a, there's a site called Folk Streams. It just like strange stuff people have filmed a long time ago or they'll have a museum tour that's, you know, from film footage. And I saw one of these ale bowls and I jotted this uh, little sketch down. And we're going to talk a little bit later why, why I could have just taken a, you know, picture of the screen or something. But I wanted to think a little more about that form. And just by making a quick sketch, I did that. And then I was able to explore this traditional form but put, you know, my own twist on it a little bit. So this is an ale bowl, you know, that's this horse head design that I started making, you know, different versions of. This is a, a dragon version. That's floating in the river by my house, the uh, little shenango. Uh, and, you know, so I made some of those. Uh, another thing that inspires me is people that work in other materials. Um, it can be somebody working in leather, and you, you'll pick up some inspiration in... Uh, can, can be anything from the way they work to their, their uh, aesthetic or whatever, but uh, a lot of my letter carving actually, uh, an uh, another British connection, this is, Tom Perkins is a letter carver uh, here in Stone, mainly in Britain, and this book uh, kind of opened my eyes uh, to how creative lettering could be, that it's way beyond just printing out some fonts on the computer and stuff, and you know, there's, there don't have to be exact rules to spacing and all these sorts of things. And uh, this, in fact, the, on the, there's a society here, I guess, in England called the Lettering Arts Trust, where they focus on especially hand-cut memorial stones, getting away from just the feed it into the computer and run it through a sandblaster stones and hooking people up in Britain with uh, sensitive artists that can make a meaningful stone and often for, you know, even prices that are very, you know, in line with the mass produced ones that people feel they have no choice but go with. So uh, this, this uh, one here, if you can see that, uh, it's hard, it's got a couple birds on it. This is by a, a, a woman named uh, Louise Tip Lady, I think is her name, and it's fantastic stuff. So this is an example. I've done a little bit of the carving in stone. This is almost all. This is about, this is uh, a little 
just a little uh, stone to, for a friend of mine lost their uh, Springer Spaniel Lucy, and so just a little. And the, the nice thing is, uh, in stone, there's no grain. It's funny, you can just go, oh, this way and this way, and it goes all over, yeah. Um, so this, of course, is just in paper and ink. But this calligraphy, this is Arabic calligraphy. Normally, if I, if I didn't know, I would have no idea what it says, but it's beautiful. And that, things like that you know, show me that you know, whatever the lettering says, even if you're seeing it from a distance, if it's carved, it just becomes a pattern of light and shadow that's interesting uh, on a carved piece. This says peace in Arabic. Uh, and of course, it takes the form of a dove, too. So you get all of those meanings there. This is a little gravestone near me. It's little touches. This was hand carved, but these little touches like this and the flowing line at the bottom, just little things like that. I don't think you have to consciously enter what your designs are, but the more you're aware of things like this around you, I think it comes out of your subconscious in you know, designs. Uh, this is a little set of steps. And it just reminds me, I, I understand the power of chip carving, but every time I walk by that, it reminds me of how just a little bit of shadow catching something can draw your attention to the lines and things like that. And then that, that might lead in some way to, you know, it's basically the same sort of thing on a spoon handle like that, or here's a, you know, a few little eating spoons. You know, it's the, basically the same thing as on those stone steps. Um, or you can do, you know, this is a larger version, this is on the handle of a bowl. But it's, you know, it's light and shadow we're just playing with. Uh, literature and poetry inspire me a lot. Uh, this, is one, this is one line from a poem by Harriet Monroe, What has bent you, warped and twisted you. And that kind of stuck in my mind. And the, that inspired the piece I was going to make because I, I just had that in the back of my mind as something that you know, was inspiring to me or that, that seemed like it could go with a piece. So I was going to make a shrink pot and was going to make it square. And when I sp split the first side, it was a twisted log consistently. And so every side had this wine to it. And then I, that poem came to my mind after I saw that. And so I, you know, what has bent you, warped and twisted you onto the side. Um, and then I used the same thing on a, a bowl here because the, the log had a bend in it. And so I just allowed the bend to stay in. And then you know, again, what has bent you, warped and twisted you just in a, in a different way. Um, this is a T.S. Eliot poem, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So. That inspired this piece. This is the, bo the bottom of the bowl because the lettering goes around the rim, okay? And the lettering, of course, ends where it started. And then the line, you know, follows around and comes back as well, that raised, raised line. Um, Tolkien fans had to throw one in for you here, okay? All that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. Of course, the second line there is the one that a lot of people uh, recognize. And so I had this cherry log. This is uh, uh, radially split. And it had this bit of a winding twist to it. So I've got not all those who wander are lost. So those, uh, you know, poetry for me can inspire things too. Nature, if you've ever taken a really, we can walk by a tree and just look, now it's got green leaves on it. This is a hosta leaf, uh, and I've always thought the, f the lines flow just beautifully on these hosta leaves. And the way they come to the side and, and join back in with the line of the exterior of the leaf. So that can lead to, and it, it's not like I was thinking consciously when I made this bowl, I'm going to make it look like a hosta leaf. But that's just all in the, the framework, I think, of the inspiration. Uh, here's some flutes on a sort of hen bowl. This is an uh, orientation with the log where you split it into quarters, and then the quarter split is up. And so you see the same sort of uh, lines coming there. 
curves like on this slide. We see these sort of things every, all the time. If we take a moment to just look at the curve, you don't have to copy the exact curve, but you just get used to thinking and noticing these things, and then it might come out in your spoons in one way or another, just um, have things flowing. Uh, or the lettering, you know, uh, here the curves just flowing together and stuff, that's on a you know, spoon handle. Um, I, I try to make little sketches sometimes of nature because it helps me to notice things more. If I, if I stop to actually make a little sketch, I look closer than I normally would. Um, and it, this didn't strike me till I was getting this together, but I saw this picture and then I saw the uh, uh, a little sign I've just, just made for a tally fest here. And you can see this sign and it kind of made me think of the color combination and the tree branches and, and so on, even though that's meant to be a little more birch-like. Now this one kind of, you know, this is throwing you, uh, you know, now I'm really, I'm really reaching now, that's for sure. But uh, now I've, seriously, I'm, I'm really not into cars at all, but I do, it, it, it's, it's an Aston Martin I had to do, you know, it's an Aston Martin. So uh, some of you probably know the model and everything, right? So, but I've always been amazed by how w you have two surfaces here. You have a surface and a surface. They could have just rounded that over, they could have just blended it all together, but they chose to stop those surfaces at certain points. You can tweak this one, if you tweak this surface in or this surface in, you're going to affect the flow of that line. And so they've got to consider, and we do the same thing when we're spoon carving, when you move one surface, you can change the flow of the line that shows up when the shadows hit it. So. Uh, you can use that same concept, you know, just one idea is where these surfaces are not at 90 degrees to each other, it's just a subtle difference, but by controlling that line between the surface, you can affect the shadows and the way they appear. So little things that I see like that, uh, you know, inspire me in some form. And so here again on this, this is a little sort of a cat sculpture carving, and rather than just round everything into each other, I concentrate on those forms in between. Graceful lines like this is a Al Hirschfeld drawing and of course a, a ballerina might just come through in graceful lines on, on a piece. Um, or a spoon or lettering, uh, it's a big uh, white oak sign. Um, birds inspire me so I do lots of birds uh, and this shows how, I, normally I don't do this sort of thing, but one I did in this case for some reason a while ago, where I, I drew a picture of a chickadee and then thought about how would I translate that into a simple bowl form inspired by that, okay? And I still haven't actually made that bowl, just have to wait for the right piece to come along. And this is just a little bird that, you know, can be inspired by it or this, you know, birds, birds are fascinating to me and so it often comes out in some of the bowls and I think the crooks have the natural shape to flow with it. And there's a duck, uh, a duck, you know what's coming next? Goose, duck, duck, goose, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, you have, do you have that game in England? Do you guys do duck, duck, goose? No? No, barn, you don't know this? You go around the circle, you duck, I forget what the rules are, you, and then a kid has to get up and chase you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they have to run around the circle? Oh, right. thank you, I'm, so, I'm glad somebody... We, we should do duck, duck, goose, yeah, okay. Um, anyway, uh, crooks themselves inspire me, or any, any particular, uh, uh, you know, character of the wood, I'm often just inspired for a design by what that particular piece of wood has to offer. And that you know, takes me off the hook to a certain extent. It takes the pressure off me. I just, what, does, what can this piece do for me? And, and, and what would, would it possibly be? So this is an oak crook, which is the, about the last thing, I, you know, I was splitting up some firewood and stuff, but this, this was oak. And I thought, well, I can't not use that. And this, that turned into this uh, rooster 
shape because it's such an extreme crook, you know, it's able to come up. So you can see the grain. This, this would be, you know, pretty impossible to make with a straight piece. So that, that crook itself is what led to that piece. Uh, you know, I couldn't, I can't think of the piece before and then go looking for the crook, you know, it has to go the other way around. Uh, of course, you know, some extreme bends like this, the crooks inspire that. You, you, again, it needs, needs a crook to do that. Um, here's one that I happened to take this picture and then the finished piece was lined up almost perfectly by accident. So this is a big uh, cherry uh, branch, uh, you know, coming off of there. And I just like that curve, the way it came up off. And, you know, traditionally I might just say, well, I'll cut it off here and make a ladle. There'll be a, a spoon coming off. But, and, you know, it, that turned into, that's, that's situated just like the piece was, okay. Um, that's a, you know, sort of a goose form. This is another sort of smaller goose, but it, I like to, I wanted to show that the crooks don't always go in a straight line from above. And I just let that, you now you can play with it a little bit and get, bend it to your will a little, but I just let that flow through the piece you know, when viewed from above as well. Um, another thing that inspires me, I think is what a lot of us are hooked on, is the process itself. Every time you make a new piece and you smell those fresh chips again, and you, you know, you feel the wood, and you, you hear the sharp tool slicing through, and you find yourself realizing you forgot to even eat because three hours have gone by, uh, that is inspiring uh, for me, and it never gets old. Uh, and, you know, you guys, many of you, all of you, know the way that feels when a cut, you get right in that one groove. Sometimes you get so, so much in the groove, you go right through, because this is working too well right there, you know? And that's it. Um, and it's the quietness of the process sometimes. I like the physical nature of it, and I like the balance between those moments where it's just one little chip falling at a time. Um, the, the smell of the wood, you know, when I, I see that picture, I can remember, you know, the smell of that fresh maple coming, you know, up off. Uh, this is a, you know, little Yates uh, line. Man, many of you will probably recognize the poem. Uh, I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. I think for many of us, and I know the speaker tomorrow, right, will be talking a little bit about this, the, you know, the healthful nature of this and how it can bring peace, you know, what we're doing here uh, this weekend. Um, drawing for me, this is not my drawing, of course, this is Vincent Van Gogh, and we're not used to seeing Van Gogh's drawings as much as things like Starry Night and the, the very colorful paintings. But for me, there's something about anybody's drawings that are just magical and revealing. And I think part of it is, you know, might be the way they're capturing light and shadow or simple representations or something. Uh, but I think it goes back to childhood. I think for most of us, the first creative thing we did with a crayon or a pencil was make some lines on a piece of paper. And in many cases, if you go back, you'll remember there's almost this magical thrill of this didn't exist before. And I go like this, and there's, there's something there, OK? This was a picture that my daughter drew. It was on the wall of my shop, actually, when uh, she was in elementary school at some second grade or something. And, uh, what I love about it is every time I see it, it reminds me, she in particular, when she would draw, would get, especially if you were just observing from across the room and she was you know, in her own little world there and she would draw, she would get this, um, such a thrill that she would literally, you know, uh, shake a little bit or her fingers would, you know, because, and, I could understand that, and I think many of you, now, we've all done things that just make us weep, you know, when we, we, we make the mistake, but there are times where you still, this, I just made that happen, you know, it's this thrill of what create, you know, this, we're creating and not destroying, you know. Uh, 
and my own, you know, drawing inspires me too. This, I saw this, this moth was on the window screen of the shop. And if you get up really close and you observe these moth antenna, uh, they're pretty amazing, these curves and patterns and, you know. And so just by making this, and it, you know, wasn't, it didn't necessarily look exactly like that, but that wasn't the point. It was just me to think about that flow there and by drawing it, I could have just looked at it, but by drawing it, I think that it makes a special connection with our brain between the physical nature of drawing it out and, and seeing it and having to process that. Uh, this is, you know, nothing fancy or whatever, but there was a rabbit laying in the yard. Now I didn't have time, I was afraid he was gonna move, so I snapped a quick picture, then later actually went back through and, and drew it not, it's just in a, you know, little junky sketchbook, but I wanted to think about some of those, you know, just that moment, you know, and maybe the curves come into something later on. This is just my wife's purse sitting, you don't have to always, you say, well, where am I going to find a rabbit to draw, you know, but it can be anything, just a little bit, uh, you know, a little moment like that where you're driving in the car. I think a lot of people, we've got, you know, we're into this, I see it all the time at you know, school, if there's an extra five minutes, the first thing, it's, it's this motion. Well, I have a spare three minutes, or I'm, you know, but draw a little picture, all right? You know, uh, why not? Nobody even has to see it, you know? So what? Uh, you know, and it doesn't even have to be finished. You know, somebody can get up and move. Who cares, you know? The, you know, paper is, you know, pretty cheap and you can just keep making pictures and then save it, you don't know. Uh, and it can also help you more directly. And it's pretty common, you see somebody's work that you like, you take that picture of it. So maybe it'll inspire you, you wanna try that certain way they've done the cut. It's even better, of course, if you can hold their piece, if you can buy one of their spoons and, and, and look at it more carefully later. But if you can't hold the spoon and so on, or even if you can, I think drawing even if it's not a good drawing, it doesn't matter. You can see a, a bunch of different scribbles up there. The point is it forces you to really think about what that, how those surfaces interact with each other, especially if you can't carve it at the time or something. And it can be some carving that's totally out of, you know, the realm of spoon carving. Uh, sometimes I'll just work out designs on paper before I carve. Uh, because you can make some mistakes on paper and erase them easily, so that can lead to, you know, directly to a design. Uh, lettering, I'm always playing with it in drawing uh, before, especially if it's going on something a more finished piece. So, you know, that ended up on that coffee pot, um, or, you know, cold coffee. Uh, where I'm going is pretty straightforward here, going back to <laughs> Greenville, okay. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I got a little coracle there, uh, and I'll be going down the river, and I'll be walking, and I'll be carving and exploring. Uh, so there's another British connection. There you go, uh, the coracle. The, yes, you like them? Yeah, good. I knew I'd get to a slide he liked eventually. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, so... Uh, my son is starting to carve, uh, and you know he's carving some bowls, so we'll be carving together. That's one of the things we'll be doing. In fact, he's he's carved three or four. This is one of the latest ones there. That's the underside. Uh, and I want to end with a couple quotes from Bill Copperthwaite because um, it goes along with what you know what I do, I guess, and inspires me. And you know, Bill said, "What we need to what we need is to increase the sense of adventure in daily life." all year long. And I think many of us see this, uh, this is an adventure. Every spoon's kind of a new adventure and you're dis you know, discovering new things and every uh, piece of wood and you know, I'll just keep exploring uh, things. I want to explore lettering more. I want to have some adventures and all, all that, those sorts of things. Uh, and Bill also said, I want to live in a society where people are intoxicated with the joy of making things. Um, and so, I think uh, you know, we're all intoxicated with that and that's a perfect 
uh, lead into the rest of the evening, maybe, okay? So, <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, what was, oh my gosh, that's horrible that I went that long. I'm sorry. I had no idea. Yeah, um, I did a little uh, demo earlier today about using the ads to rough out spoons, and you're probably referring to hollowing out a, a bowl. Um, but, uh, you know, I think like any tool, it's the, the more it's, you, the more you use it, the more it feels like an extension of your hand, and I, you've all experienced that. Um, so I don't have, I think one thing that helps is I, I don't have 15 ads. I have, I have two that I basically use regularly, and I have one on occasion. So I get to know that tool very well, and what I like the bevels to be like, and, and so on. And ads is much harder for a tool maker to get right, or a user to tune well, than an axe is. An axe is a little more, um, you can adapt to an axe as the user more effectively. For ex you know, if I'm carving with an axe, and the bevels are a little bit steeper or flatter than I'm used to, I can just tweak the angle I'm holding it at when I swing. But since the adze is in line with the curve, or it's perpendicular, it's, it's cutting with the curve, okay, uh, that bevel has to coordinate with the swing, with the arc of the swing, or you can be slamming, you know, if a lot of adzes have too tight of a uh, hang on the adze, it's a lot of manufacturers do this, so it's kind of like, tucking your chin in like this, and what happens is it'll cut, but not very efficiently, and every time it hits, you're slamming the bevel into the, the wood instead of, it's sort of like, a, a, this is a, a pretty descriptive analogy I used in my little demo before. If you have an apple and you want to bite into it, you, you have your teeth approach it at an angle that, so they enter the apple sweetly, okay? But it, you wouldn't want somebody to take an apple and just sort of shove it against your front <laughs> teeth. And that, that's what happens. You, know, you can still get taste of the apple. It'll still cut into it, but not very efficiently. So I think one of the things that you know, leads to that skill is like anything, making sure the tool is tuned properly and sharpened properly. And then just, if you want to get better at adding, it's adds. If you want to get better at cutting with your... Uh, sloyd knife, cut more with your sloyd knife, and, and so on, so. Well, no, you'll get uh, better shadows, sharper shadows, whatever tool you're using. If you just make sure you have nice, crisp facets on the side walls, a nice, crisp junction at the bottom, and basically a lot of it is uh, when we're reading any of these things, those crisp junctions and lines is what reads you know, to us. And so it doesn't really matter what tool you use. There are people that cut letters beautifully with a series of gouges, with you know, many different things. But um, whatever tool you use, just make, you know, make it crisp. And I, I, I use a knife because I think for me it's the most effective way to accomplish, you know, lettering, small scale spoon handles, bowls, uh, you know, and then once the wood gets too hard or once it gets too large, then I need to adapt a little bit, but still I'll, uh, again, rough it out and get some of the waste out, then chase the sides often with the knife and just to remove the remainder. Um, but I try to avoid needing lots and lots of gouges to just carve a, a simple inscription and so on. Yeah. And I'll talk, I talk more about that and I'll be doing a demo tomorrow on letter carving even if you don't uh, have the, the course I do on it, the workshop. I'll talk about some of that. You just get really angry all the time. <laughs> no, it, it is, it's frustrating. Uh, some mornings, you know, I, to leave my house, uh, you walk out of the kitchen, through the shop, and out the back door. 
which is that's pretty rough because you've got a something you're working on and you walk by <laughs> I, I you might I'm, I literally will walk by like that and uh, oh you know um, but at the same time you know having said that I have a it's it's easy. I think we all can you know get a you know grass is always greener on the other side of the fence and and uh, I need to often remind myself that you know, I do enjoy you know my the job I do you know in the school and and uh, interacting with with the kids and what a uh, opportunity that is you know for me and a and a, a real pleasure in many ways, but. Uh, what I like most about it is I have the opportunity there in that aspect of my life to be creative. And, you know, it's up to me. I've got this subject I need to teach, but it's up to me. I don't have any middle manager or upper management saying, you know, really, in my administration is very good uh, to, to not say, well, we think you should be doing it this way. And so that gives me a lot of creative freedom and I appreciate that and I have that uh, balance then without having to, uh, it, it also provides freedom to my work. And I'll be the first to admit, some, some people might say, well, you know, I don't have time to mess around with all these cute little flutes you're doing and stuff like that. I gotta, and I understand because I don't need to rely on that as an income and that gives me sort of you know, and I appreciate that. I don't take it for granted. I know it's not the case for everybody. Uh, and I get to play a little more when it comes to this uh, because of that. So I just, uh, I try to just uh, keep the, the right attitude, which d doesn't always happen, <laughs> you know, but like, like anybody, you know, I have to slap myself or my wife slaps me once in a while, you know, and I, I straighten up. <laughs> yeah, um, sometimes, but I tell you, I've kind of trained myself uh, a little bit. I don't have a whole lot of mental discipline, but I've trained myself to, to that extent to think. And I've noticed the same time when I'm doing axe work here on the end grain and I'm tri tripping this away, that's one of these moments where I, if the thought enters your mind, you know how easy it would be to, you know, I could go, I could go over that a quarter inch and just mess up all the, if, if the thought enters your mind, it's going to happen. That's the next thing that's going to happen. So I try to not think about that, but it, you know, a lot of it is I try to, especially if, you know, here's a bowl, for example, I, I could go ahead and do some, some lettering on this if I wanted to, um, but I would make sure that I would work out all the design issues that I wanted to on paper first, and then get some lines on here. Uh, it's still possible it can overcut or something. And the nice thing is, you know, first of all, there are some things it's hard to recover from. But for most things, you can have an overcut. You can have, a, oh, I didn't mean to do that. And then you'd make a little design change, and you're the only one that knows it was a design change. It can, you know, it, sometimes uh, but I just do the best I can to, and sometimes I do make those mistakes and you scream like an idiot yourself for a while and and that's it yeah <laughs> uh, first of all I should mention that this this quote right here uh, was so special even to, uh, many of you are familiar with Peter Follinsby, I'm sure, uh, and he's been here, right, to, to Spoonfest. Uh, Pete, two years ago? Something like that. Two, I think. Peter has this quote, I know it's a long quote, but he actually, on both sides of his ax handle, has it uh, car carved in. Um, and, you know, Peter had, had met Bill uh, and, you know, spent some time with him. Uh, so I, I relate to what you're talking about. I the same thing. I mean, I, I'll see somebody knit and go, "Oh, I've got to try knitting." And I see somebody do this. I think a lot of us are probably, uh, you know, aligned with that. So 
how do I stay focused on more? Yeah. Oh, and what do I do with all these ideas I can't get to? Yeah. Uh, one thing that helps, again, and I know it's, it's, it seems a, a little bit silly or maybe I'm, you know, I'm not suggesting, nobody has to draw. I mean, I don't think like, if you don't draw, you'll never be a good car. No, I mean, you don't have to draw. I mean, it's fine. But for, yeah, yeah. so for me, what I do, if, if I have an idea and I draw it in the book, it might be, you know, every time I, I just go to a new one, and I like these just, I don't like it if the paper's too precious and so on. You get like a $25 sketchbook, and it's like, I better put something good on this piece of paper, you know? <laughs> uh, and, you know, in many cases, I'm putting in, I might, I might see a, a, a beer bottle label that I think, oh, the design's great, you know, there you go, you got a beer bottle label in there. It can be anything, it can be, this is the score for a, a card game. That, you know, so I just like, I try to, you know, keep all sorts of things in here and including, so I'll go back, in fact, just the other day I was going th back through an older one, I don't remember which one, but I was going back through it looking for something else that I knew I had made a note about and I, had this design for a bowl that involves two fish and a quote and stuff. And I saw it in there, knowing that I eventually would see it again. And so it's, as long as I know I wrote it down, that it's in there, it takes the pressure out of my mind of saying, oh, I've got to get that in. It, it takes that distraction away. It's, it's there. I know I'll see it again someday, and then I'll, I'll do it. Um, no, I don't think there's any... Uh, easy answer to that. If I had to do one thing, even in terms of what I do, bowls, what I do, spoons, what I call the letter, um, whew, that's a tough one. Uh, I would, um, I'd probably, there's so many different aspects of it, because uh, I go, it's hard to do bowl carving when you're sitting on the porch with the, you know, with your in-laws or something, you know, so I wouldn't want to give every, every, Every one of these sort of things has sort of its, uh, I can, for example, you know, letter on a spoon if I'm just sitting in the living room with, you know, the or sometime I'll actually do the spoon carving, but uh, I can carve a bowl when I just feel like going outside on a nice day or whatever at the chopping block and really doing some physical work, and I, and I don't necessarily just want to sit there doing this all the time, but I suppose the thing that involves most of that in one is probably, a, a, I'd stick with bowls because uh, I can do the heavy work, I can do the, uh, the more delicate stuff, I, it can be a canvas for some lettering of sorts, it's more, I can do bird sculptures and, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but I do find more and more I can see going down in delving into the lettering a lot more. I think that's and, uh, and even, I think I want to do more experimenting with the, the stone uh, letter cutting and all that, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.